Uh, thank you very much. I'd like to thank the organizers to give us the opportunity to present our work. Uh, this paper is uh, joined with Scott Condi and Jain Ganguly, and the title is Information Inertia. Okay, now what's motivating this work? Well, uh, or also my previous work, suppose so you receive information about the future value of an asset. Uh, you don't know uh, how to link this information uh, to asset values. Uh, you may be biggest about this. When you uh, condition on this information, there are two things that you face, uh, risk uh, and also maybe uh, ambiguity. Now, what are the questions? There are two main questions that we're trying to uh, answer in this, in this paper is, the first one is, how does ambiguity about the predictability of future asset values affect optimal portfolios? And then in equilibrium, well, how does the ambiguity about the predictability of future cash flows uh, affect its equilibrium price? And to give you a preview uh, of the result, so the answer to the first question uh, we're going to find is that there will be optimal portfolios, uh, risky portfolios, also the risk-free portfolio, uh, that will not react to news or not always react to news. And uh, in equilibrium, what we will see is if ambiguous about uh, the predictability of future cash flows, then the stock price will fail to incorporate all the public available information in equilibrium. And uh, as a result of that, uh, there will be a momentum. Okay, so let's uh, go into it. I want to start with a brief outline of my talk. First, uh, I'm going to present a very simple model. It's going to be a static model, a uh, current normal framework where we introduce uh, uh, ambiguity about uh, the conditional distribution of a signal. Uh, after that, uh, I'm going to talk, we're going to do portfolio choice, fix the price, and compute uh, the optimal demand as a function of the signal. Uh, the next step is to consider simple exchange economy with a representative agent. And uh, then we're going to ask how does the price uh, depend on the ambiguous signal. Uh, then uh, the next step, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how to uh, aggregate investors. So we're going to introduce heterogeneity uh, of investors, also multiple investors. Uh, I'm going to talk about the equilibrium price, and then I'm also going to show you that you will have this, uh, equilib also this uh, information inertia and demand uh, in equilibrium. And then if there's some time left, I will talk a little bit about uh, momentum strategies uh, that you will, will you get in this model, and maybe some extensions before I conclude. Okay, so let's start with the model. There are two dates, it's a static model, zero and one. There's a risky asset with a price P and future value D tilde. Uh, there's a risk-free asset, uh, I'm not gonna do much with it, we'll normalize the interest rate to zero, and uh, there's no consumption at date zero. Now, uh, W naught is the initial wealth, uh, theta, the number of shares that you invest in the risky asset, and the future wealth, W tilde, the budget constraint is simply how much you have today, uh, the price change times how much uh, you're going to invest in the asset. Okay, so very simple framework. Now let's look at the uh, information structure. As I suppose uh, we observe a signal before we take an action about the future value uh, of the asset, D tilde. Now uh, write down the joint distribution of the signal and the dividend, assume it's normal. Uh, the marginal distribution of the dividend is just the mean is d bar, the variance sigma d squared. Uh, there's no ambiguity about the marginal distribution of the dividend. There's also no ambiguity about the marginal distribution of the signal. Uh, that's why I just for simplicity normalize uh, the mean uh, of the signal to zero and the variance uh, to one. Now uh, what we're interested in is uh, ambiguity about uh, the covariance between the signal and the dividend. This covariance I will denote with beta, and uh, we're gonna do a uh, Bayesian updating prior by prior to compute the conditional distribution. There will be uh, a set. So investors are ambiguity versus in the sense of Gilbert and Smidler. They have a set of possible covariances, beta A and beta B. Uh, beta B, B, of course, the covariance has to be uh, less than uh, uh, the two variances, the so sigma D times one. Uh, in this talk, uh, which I think is the more interesting case, we're going to focus on the, on the case where beta A is greater than zero, uh, which means there's no ambiguity about the fact uh, that there's a positive correlation between uh, the signal uh, and the dividend. 
then Bayesian updating for each uh, beta in this uh, interval just leads to a set of posterior distributions. Those are the conditional distribution of the dividend given the signal. We just have the posterior mean. It's just d bar plus beta times the signal. And uh, the residual variance, which is just sigma d squared minus uh, beta squared. So that's the information uh, structure. Now, uh, let's continue with the preferences. As I said, it's multiple priority. Uh, the agent uh, maximizes uh, the minimum over this set of betas. Expected utility of U, the general utility function of future wealth, conditional on uh, the signal uh, that he is going to receive. Now, uh, what we're going to assume is that investors have cover utility. As so a gamma is the coefficient of absolute risk aversion, then uh, maximizing uh, the utility up there is equivalent to just maximizing uh, the certain equivalent here. As so a here, that's the certain equivalent of a standard expected utility guy uh, who believes the covariance is as beta. It's just standard. We have the posterior mean minus the price times uh, demand, and then here minus one half gamma, the risk premium times demand squared. And here, of course, we have to consider uh, the worst case scenario. Okay. Now, uh, before I write down what this uh, certain equivalent is, uh, let's look at the trade-offs. As you can see here that uh, the choice, uh, the covariance or correla correlation choice is going to affect both uh, the mean and the variance. Uh, and this is going to lead to interesting uh, trade-offs. Okay. So let's look at uh, the conditional mean first. Suppose you contemplate the long position and the asset. Then uh, the worst case scenario for the mean is uh, that uh, there's a low correlation between the signal and the dividend, as you consider as beta A, if you receive good news. Because in this case, it will only moderately revise the expected value of the asset downwards. On the other hand, if you receive bad news, then the worst case scenario is that there is a high correlation between the signal and the dividend. Because in this case, it will significantly revise the expected value of the asset downwards. Of course, if the signal confirms the unconditional mean, then uh, you just have the d bar, uh, the posterior mean is not going to depend on uh, the correlation. Now, for the conditional variance, uh, the worst case scenario is always that uh, you don't learn much from the signal, which means the covariance is uh, the lowest possible. Okay. Now, what you can see here, uh, if you contemplate a long position in the assets, then uh, there's going to be a trade off between the mean and the variance if you receive bad news. Because for the mean, you want to consider a high beta. For the variance, you want to consider a low beta. Okay, so keep this in mind. Now, uh, let's look at a certain equivalent. So here I'm going to focus on bad news. Now, we have four different cases here. Now, first, let's look at the case when you, when you contemplate a, long, a short position in the asset. In this case, both the worst case scenario for the mean and the variance is going to be a low beta, which means this is just a certain equivalent of a standard expected utility guy a savage guy who behaves as if uh, the correlation is beta A. Now, if uh, you contemplate a moderate uh, long position in the asset, then uh, you're more worried about the mean. That's why you behave as if uh, the correlation is a co the covariance or correlation is a high beta. Now, if you take on very, very risky positions, so a, lo a huge long position in the asset, then you're more worried about the variance, which means the worst case scenario is again, it's going to be low beta. The interesting case is here. There's an intermediate range of portfolio positions for which the certain equivalent here, this is, look, this is the certain equivalent of a standard expected utility guy who has not received the signal or thinks the correlation is zero. And there is a penalty term here, which depends on the signal. And this is going to be the interesting case. So let's look at this. Uh, in a little more detail. Okay. So here again, uh, we have a right on a certain equivalent. Uh, in this range, we're in an interior. So if you look here at the worst case scenario belief, it's just a quadratic function in beta. Beta enters linearly in the mean and quadratic uh, in the residual variance. Now, if you compute the optimal beta, then you can see here, well, it's depending on the signal, a new surprise. Uh, divided by risk, as a risk aversion and how uh, risky the position is. You can think about this in the following way. If uh, risk goes up, you're more worried about the variance, which means beta star goes down. 
Well, it can go all the way down to beta A, and then you just consider beta A. Similarly, if, uh, let's say, the new surprise goes up, then uh, you're more worried about the posterior mean. Your beta star goes up, goes, can go up all the way to beta B, and then you just uh, consider beta B. Now, if you plug back in, but you can see here the trade-off. Uh, if you plug this beta star back in at a certain equivalent, here, uh, well, you have here uh, beta and this linear and the mean, but this is, of course, also affected linearly by the portfolio position, and uh, quadratic here uh, for the variance term, which means if you plug back in here, uh, this uh, theta cancels out, and you get uh, the certain equivalent, where here you just have the unconditional mean of the dividend, the unconditional variance, and here you have a penalty term. And if you compute marginal utility, and that's going to be key, marginal utility in this range is not going to depend on the signal. As so here, uh, and this is going to be crucial for all the results uh, in the paper, is that you receive a signal, you're ambiguous about it, you don't take, into a, you don't take it into account uh, when you uh, will see choose your optimal portfolio, but it still, it hurts you. You don't like it. It affects your utility. It lowers your utility. Okay. So here, uh, this uh, concludes uh, the model section. Uh, the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to do uh, portfolio choice. Okay. So let's do portfolio choice. Uh, first, I'm going to talk about the SAVAGE, or Standard Expected Utility Benchmark. Uh, we just have a standard expected utility guide with a single uh, dogmatic beta. We fix the stock price, and I define here just uh, the unconditional risk premium, the unconditional mean of the dividend minus uh, the price. Now, uh, as we all know, the demand of a standard expected utility guide is just posterior mean minus price divided by uh, the risk premium. And uh, for standard expected utility guy, if there's a positive covariance, then here, if you take the first derivative, it's always going to be positive. Or, uh, he will always react uh, to changes in the signal. If the signal is better, he will invest uh, more in the asset. Now, this is no longer true uh, with uh, ambiguity. So here, uh, if you look at uh, a positive uh, unconditional risk premium, you have a lot of cases to consider. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm not going to go over the formulas. I'm going to do it uh, by means of a picture. So if you look at this picture here, so here I focus on an unconditional risk premium that is positive. On the x-axis, uh, we have the signal. And on the y-axis, we have uh, optimal demand for uh, four different uh, agents here. So here we have the blue line is uh, a savage guy who thinks uh, the covariance is beta A. This is a savage guy who thinks uh, the covariance is beta B. This is a savage guy who thinks the covariance is zero or didn't receive a signal, so that's the green one. Of course, we have insensitivity here. And then here, the black solid line, this is our ambiguity averse guy. And now what you can see here is that, uh, well, first of all, for very negative signals, uh, in this case, uh, the demand is going to be negative. And here, negative signal, negative demand, the worst case scenario for the, both the mean and the variance is a low beta, which means here you have uh, demand of the ambiguity versus guy is exactly the same as demand of a standard expected utility guy who thinks the correlation is low. Now, here uh, we have uh, information inertia for the risk-free portfolio. This uh, already appeared in, in many other papers. I mean, we, we know with Gilboa and Smiler preferences uh, at the kink, this is at the kink of the indifference curve, uh, well, there can be a large change in the price but uh, you're not going to change your portfolio. Now here, the same thing. Uh, fix the price. If there is a discrete change in a signal, uh, you are ambiguity or worse. Uh, you're not going to trade away from a portfolio uh, that does not, uh, that is risk-free or that there's no ambiguity. So you need a discrete change uh, to, as a large discrete change to actually go long or short. This happens at the kink. Now here, uh, if, if you consider this case, now, we receive a positive signal. Uh, sorry, you receive a negative signal. But uh, here you have a moderate for this specific uh, unconditional risk premium in the signalization. You have uh, a moderate position in the asset. 
which means the worst case scenario for you is uh, that uh, the covariance is high, is beta b, because you're more worried about the mean than the variance, and which means your demand looks exactly the same as the demand of a standard expected utility guy who thinks the covariance is high. Now for very, very risky position, the variance dominates, which means you, you behave as if a standard expected utility guy who thinks oh, there's a low beta. Now the interesting part is here, and this is where we're in the interior, where marginal utility, I showed you before, is insensitive to changes in the signal. Here, uh, you don't react to the signal. So there's information inertia uh, for a risky uh, long position. Uh, you can have uh, changes in the signal, but you're not going to uh, adjust uh, your portfolio position. And just to point something out, this is not something that happens at a kink because uh, the envelope, envelope theorem is at work here. Uh, the certain equivalent is differentiable everywhere except, uh, of course, uh, at zero. Okay, so this is uh, the portfolio inertia result. Okay, now uh, similar picture for a negative unconditional risk premium. Now uh, let's look at, let's do a little bit uh, comparative statics here. As a here uh, on the x-axis, again, I have the signal and on the y-axis, I have demand for different uh, unconditional risk premia. As a here, uh, we just looked uh, at the case uh, where the unconditional risk premium is positive. If the unconditional risk premium is zero, then uh, the effect goes away. Uh, the intuition is, in this case, if the unconditional risk premium is zero, the only reason uh, to go along uh, the asset is if you uh, receive a good signal. But if you receive a good signal, the worst case scenario for the mean and the variance is a low beta. That's why you behave like a standard expected utility guy with a low beta. Similarly, uh, if the only reason uh, to go short is if you get a bad signal, and in this case, again, for both uh, cases, the mean and the variance, the worst case scenario uh, is uh, a low beta. As so here, what you should take away from this picture is that, uh, well, positive unconditional risk premium, you have information inertia uh, for uh, long positions, and uh, negative unconditional risk premium, you have the information inertia for uh, short positions. Okay, so let's, let's move on uh, to the next step. Uh, so this is the partial equilibrium portfolio choice result. Uh, you have uh, risky portfolios that uh, do not react uh, to news. Now the next thing I wanna talk about uh, how, uh, also what's happening if you have a rep agent economy who is ambiguous in the sense that I just described, and uh, what does this mean for the equilibrium price? So that's the next thing uh, that I'm gonna talk about. Okay, so let's, let's look into this. As so you the assumption quite standard. There's a risky asset again, price P. Now uh, D tilde is just a liquidating dividend, simple exchange economy. The risky asset is in unit supply, uh, no consumption at D0. I just consider the risk-free asset uh, as numeraire. Uh, the risk-free rate is zero. Now uh, there's a representative investor, just described before, with car utility, who is averse to ambiguity and consider this set uh, of covariances, beta A uh, and beta B. And then in equilibrium, well, the rep agent has to hold the asset and uh, will consume uh, the liquidating dividend. Okay, those are the assumptions. Now, uh, what do we get? Well, we all know that uh, if the rep agent is a standard expected utility maximizer with belief beta, then the price is just the posterior mean minus uh, the risk premium. It's a gamma times the residual variance. Now, uh, if the rep investor is averse to ambiguity, then uh, there are three cases here to consider. So there's uh, two cutoffs for the signal. Uh, they, both cutoffs are uh, negative news. In the first case, uh, you have uh, the price, it's exactly the same as the price in a rep agent economy where the, where the rep agent is a standard expected utility maximizer with uh, a low beta. Uh, for very bad news, uh, rep agent uh, with uh, a high beta. And here the interesting, the new thing here is there's a range of signals for which uh, the price doesn't depend on the signal. So here it looks exactly the same as the price in an economy where there was no signal or the rep agent thought that the covariance is zero. 
Okay, so let's look at, at this at a picture. So here, again, on the x-axis, uh, I have uh, the signal. And on the y-axis, I have the equilibrium price uh, for five different cases. As I hear, uh, every color corresponds to uh, a rep agent uh, with a specific belief. Those are the first four standard expected utility guys with covariance beta A1. Uh, that's the midpoint 2, 3, and 0. And this is our uh, ambiguity verse guy. Okay. Now, I said before, if uh, news are very bad, then the rep agent uh, has to hold uh, the acid in equilibrium. The variance does not depend on the signal, but the mean does. Well, the worse the signal, now you start worrying more about the mean, which means the worst case scenario belief of the rep agent for very bad news is going to be a high beta because he's more worried about the mean, which means here the price is exactly the same as, the, as an economy where the rep agent has this high beta. Now, for moderately bad news or for good news, the price looks exactly the same as in an economy where the rep agent has a low beta. Now, the interesting case here is this range of signals from minus 3 to minus 1, where the price here does not incorporate the information. So there's insensitivity. The price does not react to changes uh, in the signal. Now, let's look at this more carefully. What's the intuition for this? So here, uh, I chose this, this line here where you have... Uh, a standard expected utility guy who thinks the covariance is two. Now, let's say the signal drops. So let's, let's consider this point here and the signal drops. The variance doesn't change, but uh, the mean goes down, which means uh, he will require a lower price to hold the asset in equilibrium. Now, what's what is happening uh, if the, the rep agent is ambiguity verse? Well, in this case, well, if the signal drops, then you have the same effect on the mean. Well, you would want uh, a lower price to hold the mean. But there's something else going on, which means the worst case scenario belief, this interval is going to change. The worst case scenario belief is going to uh, increase. Beta star goes up, which is even, uh, that's for that reason, the mean goes even down further. But now the variance or the risk premium also changes. And these, effect, these two effects exactly offset each other, and as a result, the price doesn't change at all. As so here, uh, to summarize here, so we have uh, a repressive agent economy. There's only one guy. He gets information. There's no ambiguity about the fact that there is a positive correlation, but the way uh, he acts uh, leads to uh, a region of signals for which uh, the price doesn't change. Yeah. Just to clarify, did this flat, exactly flat region is specific to Carag uh, Caragosia or? Um, so that's, that's a good question. We're working on the generalization. So far what I can tell you, uh, it definitely goes through if you have mean variance pr preferences and normal, normal updating. So it works, of, yeah. Other than that, so we, we have not made a lot of progress yet on generalizing this. Because what you need is mean variance preferences and uh, normal, normal regression. Then you get it for sure. Yeah, I, I, what, I, what I think here, what's, what's striking is, e, it's, I think it's even more surprising that so here there's, there's only one guy who yeah. sees the signal yeah. and it, there's no ambiguity about the fact that there's a positive correlation, but it's not going to be effect end up in the price. Or at least. There's ambiguity about the size of the um, Ambiguity about the size of this? Are you saying there's no ambiguity? No, what I mean is like beta A is positive, which means the whole the whole interval uh, is, he only they considers. How big it is. I mean, they don't know where it is. No. Yeah. yeah. Okay. How much? Okay, now let me, real quick, I talked about this. Let, let me talk about this a little bit. Uh, as you hear, this is just talking about the likelihood of information inertia. Uh, well, I need this picture before. Now, we need this trade-off between the mean and the variance, meaning if uh, the repressive investor is risk neutral, he only cares about the mean, and then we are back to uh, Epstein and Snyder result that, well, you overreact to bad news and you underreact to good news. 
But as soon as you have uh, risk aversion, then uh, there's this trade-off that I just described between the mean and the variance, and then you get this uh, inaction region. Now, this inaction region is going to get bigger uh, if there's more risk, but uh, where it's happening, so this region of signals, also uh, is getting uh, worse and worse. So, uh, it's also going to be less likely, which means as a result, if you look at the probability of having information inertia, so the probability of being in this region is a non-monotonic function of uh, the unconditional risk premium in the economy. So here, you don't have information inertia if you're risk neutral. If there's a lot of risk in the economy, then uh, the signal has to be very, very bad that you're more worried about the mean, which means uh, most of the time uh, you will just behave like a standard expected utility guy who thinks the correlation is low. But then there's for some uh, regions, also for some riskiness, uh, this uh, probability of being in this region, the probability of having information inertia can be quite high. So this is unconditional and here I also have the red line is conditional on bad news and the blue line is conditional on a one standard deviation bad news surprise. Okay. Now, so this concludes uh, the equilibrium result. Now, the next thing I want to talk about, I want to talk a little bit about uh, heterogeneity, so if there are heterogeneous investors in the economy, they all receive the same signal. So there's one uh, public signal, uh, but they are heterogeneous with respect to possibly risk aversion and uh, ambiguity aversion. Now, what do we get in this case? So first of all, if uh, you have a homogeneous ambiguity, so if you have, let's say, uh, the number of investors, they may differ respect to risk aversion. It's CARA, which means wealth is trivial. Then, uh, but they all have the same interval of ambiguity. Then there's going to be a rep agent. It's the same as our standard expected utility result. You just add up the risk tolerances of all investors and you have the rep agent. Now, if there is heterogeneous ambiguity, then uh, it you will get information inertia. If you take this set of every investor, and take the intersection. And if this intersection is positive mass, then uh, you have information inertia, and it's exactly described by this uh, intersection, as how big it is. Now you knew beta A, beta B is just this uh, intersection. Of course, this, is, this means that there's no information inertia if you have uh, standard expected utility guys. They always move, uh, they always uh, react to the signal, which means as a result, they will also uh, affect the price. So this is a little bit about aggregation. Now uh, let's look at the price. Yeah? So, so say what the setup here is with the aggregation. Like what are you guys doing? So here, um, it's going to be the same uh, model as before. You have, let's say, uh, N investors. They all receive the same signal. They all are uh, ambiguity verse, mm -hmm. uh, described by uh, this interval, sorry, beta AH and beta BH. So that's the the uh, interval of every investor. And then I, ha I don't have this on the slide. They can also have just different risk tolerances, gamma H. Now, wealth can be different, but it's CARA, does, it's not going to matter. Now, if they all have the same ambiguity interval, then there's a rep agent. As before, as you just add up all the risk tolerances. Um, if not, then uh, you have to take the intersection of all these, these guys, so all their intervals of ambiguity. And if this intersection of uh, beta A, beta B uh, has a positive mass, <laughs> then uh, you have information inertia, as you have this uh, inaction region. And if it's empty, then, then no. Then you don't. So for instance, if you have a standard expected utility guy, uh, it's going to be a point. Uh, as if it's empty, you don't. And uh, if it doesn't have positive mass, uh, you don't. One guy is enough, yeah. But, but then what is the pricing look like? That's the next, next slide. <laughs> yeah. So here uh, I have an example. So here uh, I have uh, the signal. Two savages. Excuse me? Two savages. <laughs> yeah, I call them savages and nice. Okay, so the standard expected utility guys are, are the savages and the ambiguity was Guy, those are two, uh, two nights. So here, I consider two, six different economies. 
five economies where you just have heterogeneous beliefs, standard expectability guys. And then here we have an economy of two ambiguity diverse guys. And here I chose an example where you have uh, a positive, as we've taken the intersection, this intersection is positive mass. Then you can see here, uh, well, that's the equilibrium price uh, when there is ambiguity version. As here you can compute this. And uh, here you, you have the intersection, which is, uh, yeah, it's, it's, what is the intersection? One, one, two, which means you have here this range of signals is, is minus two, minus one. As here, you still have uh, the inaction region. And then uh, the other lines are just uh, the results of the heterogeneous beliefs economy. When you have uh, standard expected utility guys, if they think there's a positive correlation, then you will have always uh, a price reaction. Okay, so let's, let's look, so this is the equilibrium price. Here uh, with two nights with uh, 0.5 and 2 and 1 and 3 as uh, intervals. Now let's look at what their demand looks like. Let's look at the demand, okay? So this is equilibrium demand. It always has to add up to 1. Now the black line is uh, the guy who th has this ambiguity of, uh, interval, 0 0.5 and 2, and the red guy it has 1 and 3. Now for very bad news, uh, He's gonna, also both, they're both gonna react to the signal, but they both act at, like standard expected utility guys who just have to believe three and two, which means, well, he uh, thinks there's a higher correlation, uh, which means this guy increases the demand as a function of the signal. This is an equilibrium. The other guy reduces it. But now you can see here, uh, now this guy after two, so there's a critical signal value. Now he wants not to react. So the, he uses the unconditional mean and variance uh, to determine the demand. But the other guy still pushes the price. And in equilibrium, the price depends on the signal, which means, but now what's happening? Well, he lowers his demand because in the demand function is just minus the price, which depends on the signal. Mean and risk premium do not. So now he starts to re reduce his position and the other guy increases uh, its position in the asset. Now here, now you have the overlap. They both don't react, and as a result in equilibrium, the price doesn't react. And then here, uh, now uh, it's the same intuition as before. The other guy now starts to increase the demand, and the other guy is lowering its demand. Uh, so this is what's going to happen in equilibrium, and you can see here, uh, even like in uh, in equilibrium, uh, you can have this uh, information inertia result. Okay, now, how much more time do I have? Five minutes. Okay, so this is just more pictures of equilibrium demand. Let me say a few things about uh, predictability and then I'm going, okay, I'm going to conclude. Okay. Um, so here, what I'm going to do is, so here we have the dividend and the equilibrium price. And uh, what I'm going to do here is I'll just simulate uh, out of, so the data generating mechanism, I assume that uh, the covariance is just two. So the covariance that generates the data, the dividend and the signal uh, is two. And uh, then around the following regression, I request the price change on the constant uh, and the signal. Now, if you assume that the rep agent has the same uh, covariance as uh, the econometrician or uh, the data generating beta, then of course the slope is going to be zero. The price fully incorporates correctly the information, which means there's no uh, predictability. Now, if uh, you deviate from rational expectation and you assume that uh, the rep agent in the economy thinks uh, the covariance is higher. As a result, well, the price is going to overreact, overshoot, which means, well, uh, you get uh, a negative correlation. If you have a standard expected utility guy who uh, thinks the covariance is lower than the actual one, then the price underreacts. And as a consequence, if you run this regression, you're going to have a positive coefficient. Now, this is the case uh, when there's ambiguity. Now, if there's no risk, then in this case, well, for bad news, you overreact. 
for good news, you underreact. This averages out, which means the slope is going to be zero. Now, if you increase risk, now you get, first of all, this underreaction also happens for bad news. And uh, in addition, you all of a sudden have, you're going to have this in action region, which means the price is not fully incorporating the information, which means, well, uh, you will get predictability. Now, the interesting thing, though, is that you can actually go outside of this interval. And I think that's, that's a very nice result. You can actually have something that, as a, a predictability, a slope, that you cannot create with any standard expected utility guy in this interval. And uh, the coefficient also is going to depend on uh, the risk in the economy. Now, very risky, I said this before, then uh, you're going to be back to uh, a price that looks very much like the price in a standard expected utility economy uh, with a low beta. Okay, so that's the predictability <laughs> result. Now, uh, Momentum, well, you can run the same regression on the price. It looks similar. It's not exactly the same because the price is uh, not normal. It's not a linear function of the normal signal, uh, but the intuition uh, is uh, very similar. Okay, now I don't have much time for extension. Maybe it comes up questions. So let me conclude here. Um, so what we're doing here is uh, we assume that investors are ambiguous about the predictability of future asset values. And then we're going to show that uh, there are risky portfolios as a long position uh, that does not react uh, to a range of bad news, a short position that does not react to a range uh, of good news. There's also a range of good and bad signals for which uh, you don't participate in the market, or so you don't uh, invest in the asset at all. And then in equilibrium, uh, prices fail to incorporate all publicly available information. And as a result, uh, you can get trading strategies based on the signal or the price uh, that are profitable. So you get uh, predictability. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>